Um, we'll get started here. Uh, first of all, the talk has been very well promoted, I would say. Uh, <laughs> one thing, one interesting thing that Dennis left out was that the uh, the company that bought my previous uh, phase noise analyzer product was the company that actually produced the um, the very first and so far, besides mine, the only digital phase noise and stability test set uh, in the industry. Um, and it's basically exactly what got me into the business. I there's a Dennis mentioned that I'm a member of a group called Time Nuts. Time Nuts, uh, the alpha dog of that particular group is a guy named Tom Van Bach, who has, I won't get into you know, his accomplishments and uh, his, his reputation, but he has the best toy collection in the business. And uh, when I saw, he, he had one of the very first of the Symmetricom uh, phase noise test sets. Um, as part of this toy collection. And when I first saw it, it was just like a switch going on. I had to have one of these. <laughs> so uh, we'll get we'll get to that a little bit later in the talk, but um, everything that I've done for the past several years on this is due to the work that those guys actually did. So uh, I'm, uh, I definitely, um, it's, it's not a case where I came in and kicked everybody else's butt. Out. I just did a, a more economical version of what they already were shipping. Uh, People like it, so with that, we'll get started. Can I mention a short story about Tom Van Bach to give you an idea of how um, serious the time nuts are? He um, had five cesium standards, I think he probably, well, he, well anyway, he, he, he did. He five because, in his bedroom. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, uh, okay. So now, his, he decides to go on a camping trip up to um, Mount Rainier, okay, with his kids. He brings three of them along, the running, and the cesium clocks. Uh, Einstein's theory of relativity says that uh, the lower the gravity is, the faster a clock will run. Or conversely, the stronger the gravity is, the slower clocks will run. And he leaves two of the clocks down below at sea level in his house. He spends three days up there. He drives back down. And then he measures the time difference between the three clocks that he took up the mountain and the two that are left behind. And he does the calculations and proves that Einstein's general theory of relativity did in fact predict the, the time shift that he measured. So um, these people are very, very serious about what they, and he's given the paper on that. He yeah, wrote, well, wrote he, he's, on that. he's given a paper on it, and he's also reproduced the experiment for a, uh, a network TV show. I forget what the name of it is, but uh, he had a nice, they had some reporters follow him up the mountain and yeah. just basically check, yeah. all the, check all the data. So that, that was an extremely cool experiment. Oh, but, uh, John's one of that group of people. Yeah, no. Not the uh, not the leader by any means. <laughs> um, this um, particular deck of slides is similar to one that I created back in uh, 2010 for the Microwave Update Conference, uh, which is another ham conference that's a little more obscure. Um, as the name kind of suggests, it's it's uh, of interest mainly to microwave hams. Um, we. Um, we wanted to talk about the effect of uh, local oscillator stability and noise on uh, microwave communication. So uh, I kind of segued into that and, and uh, described some of the work that I was doing at the time, again, back in 2010, um, on the product that, or the, the, back then it was just a homebrew project that became the uh, Time Pod. Uh, so we'll get to that toward the end, but. Um, Starting out, the, the first slide kind of justifies the whole thing. And by the way, this is this is intended to be a super informal talk. Feel free to interrupt anybody um, if, uh, if you have any questions or if I'm not clear on something. Uh, don't be shy. We have plenty of time for the amount of content that I have here. Uh, I wanted to emphasize in the beginning that time is the uh, it's probably our most fundamental physical constant or physical property of, of that, that we can assign constants to. We can measure time more accurately than just about any other parameter in nature that we know of. Um, as a result, it's desirable that more and more measurements over, over time you know, become time-based. 
Um, I think, uh, for instance, this, the uh, SI standard for the kilogram is now is now time based. As this just happened over the past few years since I originally did this deck of slides, um, it's it's now based on quantum mechanical effects that, that trace back directly to, to uh, you know, the, the central time scales that are used to maintain all other time standards. Um, so I get the impression that um, measuring time in general is pretty important. That's been the case since, you know, Eratosthenes figured out the world was round. It's been the case since uh, uh, John Harris, I guess, the, uh, Harrison. Won the Harrison, won, Harrison. The, won the latitude competition. Longitude. It was a matter of long, longitude competition. It was a matter of life and death uh, for a long time. And it's still, you know, anybody that uses GPS benefits from, you know, accurate time measurement now. So that's kind of where it all starts. Um, stability. Uh, in connection with time itself has a time parameter. You can't just say that this this clock is unstable compared to this clock. You know, maybe maybe Big Ben isn't such a great clock on a minute to minute basis, but you know somebody you know goes up there and, and sets it every you know every night or every month or whatever. So long term, you know, a, a clock like that might be super stable. Um, short term it might be really crappy. And uh, Vice versa, there are other clocks that are that are great in the short term and terrible in the long term. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, at the same time, phase noise is a similar phenomenon at a much faster uh, or, or much shorter time scale. It's the same phenomenon that might uh, lead one clock to be superior to another. Um, but it, in this case, phase noise might determine, you know, how much uh, co-channel interference you have on a, on a radio link. It might determine, um, you know, how, how accurately you know your frequency or can, or can specify your frequency once it's been multiplied out. You know, if, do you have a nice thin line at the desired frequency or do you have a big noise pedestal? You know, this all comes down to phase noise. So it's an important parameter for anybody, uh, not only, you know, ham home brewers, but Commercial uh, commercial people doing any kind of uh, high quality uh, data communications. Um, everything depends on phase or time at one end of the time scale or another, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. So, kind of starting with uh, you know mentioning the long term stability side of things, I um, I kind of alluded to some of the some of the points on this slide earlier, but. Um, Again, just focusing on the things you can do if you have an accurate clock. Um, include things like by static radar, radio astronomers need it. You know, they were kind of the first users of uh, hydrogen maser clocks, which are among the best clocks you can get. Um, they're concerned with not only long-term stability, but the ability to to uh, simultaneously correlate data that, you know, taken it you know, from telescopes at very different corners of the world. Um, and, and, and that's a precision timing problem as well. Um, and then we, we mentioned GPS earlier. Everybody knows that uh, you know GPS is tied into all this pretty intimately. Measuring long-term stability um, is, you know, again half of the overall stability problem, but it, it, it's an important half. Um, the uh, the best technology for measuring frequency has traditionally been a, um, a time interval counter or a frequency counter, two, two different you know, facets of the same, same hardware. Um, the best frequency counters, the best time interval counters are good for uh, you know, precision down into the low parts in, in one per trillion, um, around uh, you know, one hertz per terahertz is uh, you know, about, about the best you can do with a frequency counter before the noise of the counter itself starts to interfere with your ability to know what frequency you're on. Um, these, uh, and this is true of the, you know, the very best frequency counters. Um, this is one of the better ones shown in this, uh, in this slide. It's 30, 40 years old almost, but still one of the, still one of the better ones. We have a, a gentleman here from Carmel Instruments who's kind of at the opposite, or, or they're, they're kind of at the high end. They're, they're staking out the high end of the market that the old HP 5370 covered back in the day. Um, so if you needed to measure frequency down to that level and you needed to use a counter, um, you know, they're the ones to talk to at this point. There's technology beyond frequency counting. 
and that's uh, what we're going to spend a lot of the time on the presentation talking about. This particular box is the one I was kind of alluding to earlier that Tom Van Bach had on his shelf uh, one day when I went over there to visit him. That's, uh, that's known as the TSC 5120A uh, phase noise test set. It's, uh, it was originally designed and marketed for phase noise measurement at you know, short-term noise, uh, but it's also you know, still probably the best instrument on the market for, uh, for you know, medium-term time measurements. Uh, ranging, you know, from seconds to hours or so. It's got a uh, got a very very good measurement floor. It's about uh, not quite a thousand times better than the best counters that I was mentioning. So, uh, if you're doing research level timing measurements um, on HF signals as opposed to you know one pulse per second ticks, this is the kind of box that's uh, super useful to you. And it's, uh, as we'll talk about later, it's also uh, the same attributes that make it a good, a good uh, frequency measurement box also make it a good phase noise measurement box. So that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the holy grail of the measurement business when it comes to both time and frequency and uh, frequency and phase noise in general. The difference to that is that works on clock signals only. Works on what? Sine waves. Clock signals only. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be a fixed frequency. And, the, and narrow band. And that's and that's a good point. A lot of what I'm talking about is is constrained to sine wave measurement or at least single frequency measurement. If you feed it a square wave, it'll measure the fundamental. If you feed it a pulse train, you'll get garbage. Um, and that's not true of the uh, the counters that, that you guys work with. I mean, you can do jitter measurements, I guess, on uh, you know arbitrary single shot. Okay. The the difference is the time counters are wide band instruments, so you get much more noise. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that, that's really the kind of kind of the key point. The thing that makes the difference between this box and that box is measurement bandwidth. This guy has a front end that's probably a couple hundred megahertz wide. Um, noise, at least in terms of white noise, is equally distributed. Any any one hertz of bandwidth is going to have the same noise power as any other one hertz. Whether you're talking about you know a low frequency in your HF or you know, daylight. Uh, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but the um, the key the key innovation with a digital test set like this is uh, is its ability to down convert to baseband, where it can do really efficient filtering and make the uh, make the time interval measurements at a really low bandwidth and get rid of all the noise. You know, that's that's not part of what you're trying to measure. That's that's really kind of the key innovation that uh, Sam Stein's people at, at Symmetricom uh, came out with when they did this. There's a uh, kind of a typical uh, plot in uh, the software that I use to support my instruments as well as some other instruments. Um, it's showing, uh, you know, it's basically the same display that you'd get on any frequency counter, but it's graphical. You get the frequency count chart at, at uh, different averaging times, and you get a graphical uh, trend view of, uh, of what's actually going on. I don't know how many of you can see this laptop, but that's kind of what it's showing right now. The uh, the cesium standard that I brought in for the demo is uh, is warming up, so it has kind of a uh, kind of a, a uh, characteristic where you see fast drift in the beginning and then slow drift, and if it's um, capable of walking now, which I guess it still isn't. Um, it would uh, eventually lock in at zero frequency offset. Uh, we'll get we'll get back to that. A little and, the, little and the standard is the little box to the right, right? The the little box is the actual measurement instrument. The oh, little, the little box is my my rendition uh, of this type of instrument. This guy? Uh, it, it, it's time the successor. Around. It's the successor to the time pod that that uh, Dennis mentioned in the introductory email that's okay. called the phase these station these are these are the uh, data sheets for the original box john developed yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get to that later. I don't want to get too far ahead of it but uh, <clears throat> this is this is basically you know this isn't going to be a surprise to anybody who's used a frequency counter because it's just giving you the same info this graph is going to be a little less familiar to a lot of people um, how many in here have, are familiar with the concept of allen deviation I know you are. Um, obviously, you are. So, John. So, so just a few people in here have been, have been involved 
uh, deeply enough to run into this particular parameter before. But uh, Allen deviation is another way to, to characterize the longer term stability as opposed to the, as opposed to the phase noise of a source. Um, it came about in the uh, 1960s at a time when uh, atomic standards were uh, were being developed and uh, commercialized, slowly but surely commercialized. Um, it, it was necessary to find ways of characterizing the stability of, of really high quality standards. Um, it was necessary to be able to handle all kinds of different kinds of noise because it turns out there are, there are different uh, different uh, flavors or colors of noise that uh, not all measurements are equally good at representing. Um, so, so Allen deviation, some of the related metrics were, were developed as a, as a solution for that. You know, the first, the first uh, thing that occurred to people was just, why not just use the standard deviation of the frequency? Um, the problem with that is that the standard deviation is obviously referenced to a mean value. It, it's, you know, the kind of the RMS deviation from a mean value. And if you have a if you have a frequency standard that's engaging in some kind of random walk activity, you don't necessarily have a well-defined mean. So you can't really take uh, you know a conventional standard deviation measurement and use that as a as a good metric of oscillator stability. So a guy named uh, Allen, David Allen, um, came up with a you know the idea of hey why don't we just use adjacent samples um, or samples spaced at you know, regular intervals that, that <coughs> correspond to the, uh, the time scale of interest. We'll just take a look at every pair of, of frequency readings separated by these intervals, and uh, the, the change in frequency between these two points um, spread out over all sets of those points at that particular interval will give us the, uh, the stability information we need. And that's basically what Allen deviation is in a nutshell. Um, and it, it, it goes back to what I was kind of saying earlier, where, where some clocks are good at long-term stability, and some clocks are good at short-term stability. If somebody is, uh, you know, somebody at the U.S. Naval Observatory or, uh, you know, the, the people who run Big Ben in London, somebody's setting the thing, tweaking the clock every once in a while, you're going to see a very good Allen deviation for that clock at a, at, toward the right-hand side of that graph. Um, Thousand second, ten thousand seconds, hundred thousand seconds, more or less a day. Um, a, a perfectly accurate clock would just would just keep getting better and better over time at longer scales. Um, at the at the left hand end of the graph, you're seeing a measurement of how these different oscillators perform from one second to the next, or from one tenth of a second to the next tenth of a second. Um, and again, some of them are a lot better than others, and the way they perform in the long term doesn't necessarily correlate to how they perform in the short term. So uh, the whole the whole time nuts um, avocation is kind of centered on on uh, you know collecting and optimizing clocks to uh, to uh, achieve the lowest numbers you can get on you know across across the entire Allen deviation range. So moving on into the phase noise area, that's the kind of the nominal subject of the talk. We're going to go from longer term measurements to, to very short term measurements, um, down from you know seconds to microsecond time scales, um, and or even faster. Um, phase noise is another way of measuring how stable your clock is, as I've said several times. Um, a couple of the points on here are, are good ones, I think good introductory points. They tell you, phase noise tells you more about this, the health of your, of your signal source, how good an oscillator it is, um, how much work you still have to do optimizing it, how much money you spend on it. It tells you a lot about an oscillator, uh, probably more than any one particular measurement beyond just, you know, what is its frequency, what is its amplitude? The next question is kind of invariably, what is its phase noise? Um, measuring the phase noise of high quality oscillators. As the oscillator gets more expensive, you can count on the phase noise measurement um, gear to become, you know, more expensive, if anything, at even a steeper rate. So it's, uh, it's, it's a big pain in the neck. You kind of have to either invest money in this or you have to put sweat equity into it. Uh, you have to do a lot of home brewing and, and hand calibration of your measurements, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, there was a guy at uh, Microwave Update Conference at the A1ZMS. Uh, I think his name is Brian, if I remember right. 
he um, he he had a good uh, little, little encapsulation of the whole idea. Stability determines what your signal sounds like. It's a big factor in determining you know what you can do with the signal that you put on the air. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the justification for uh, for getting into time measurement at very short time scales is characterizing your your oscillators transmitters. So here's a typical phase noise graph. You'll see this anytime you uh, you refer to any textbooks or any papers um, on phase noise measurement. It's a uh, it's a log log plot, kind of similar to the the Allen deviation graph. Um, but it's uh, calibrated in, in units of frequency on the x-axis <clears throat> instead of time. And in uh, dB, a unit called dBc per hertz on the left. And what that what a dBc per hertz is is basically the uh, the stability of of the oscillator reference to a measurement to a, to a not a measurement bandwidth but a, um, a interval of one hertz. Um, if you have um, if you have a if you have a traditional spectrum analyzer, it's going to have a lot of different resolution bandwidth settings on the dial. One hertz may or may not be one of those resolution bandwidths. But if you want to compare readings taken across different instruments, it's mathematically very convenient to normalize to one hertz, and that's kind of the idea behind the dBc hertz metric. That's really all there is to that. Um, as usual with noise, you know, numbers closer to zero or, or worse numbers farther away from zero down you know way down you know close to the thermal floor uh, at, one, at minus 174 are better um, a lot of you have probably seen that number batted around in you know textbooks and papers uh, minus 177 dbc per hertz is is kind of the ultimate the ultimate uh, quiet environment that you can get for a signal uh, both in am noise amplitude noise and phase noise the uh, the usual assumption is that phase noise and amplitude noise are equal, uh, so you end up with uh, they end up adding by three dB. So you see you see people refer to minus 174 as the as the uh, thermal floor, uh, one at, at zero dBm and a one hertz bandwidth. And again, that's the same same basic thing that we're measuring here. Mm -hmm. Looks like that purple purple graph has got 60 hertz spikes yep. all through it. Yep, 60 like it's hertz got a and bad harmonics. power supply. The noisy one. Yeah, um, any non-trivial phase noise measurement of a reasonably quiet source is going to have some power line harmonics. Um, usually, I'll turn off the you know the spurs altogether because I'm not really interested in seeing the, uh, those. So, I, mean, I know they're I know they're there. They're not a they're not a fundamental property of the oscillator. Um, they're they're a pain in the neck. They're hard to get rid of get entirely. Rid of, yeah. So, okay. you know, not not all of the spurs are line harmonics. Um, like. And the purple plot, that's a uh, that's a really uh, what used to be the really high end HP signal generator. Yeah, right, it's got very low. 8663. Um, what you're seeing is actually really good noise performance. That's uh, you know 10 megahertz, one hertz is close to 100 dBc. It's almost as quiet as the high quality crystal oscillator that runs it. Uh, farther out, it's not so great. It's got a lot of di it's kind of an early digital synthesizer, so it has a lot of digital artifacts and. Uh, you know some some things that you wouldn't necessarily do if you were designing a signal generator today um, that made sense to them back then. One of the things they did was they the 8663 had it, it weighs like a hundred pounds already. So one of the things they felt like they had to do was get rid of the big iron power transformer in there. So not only did they not that they switched to an earlier an early incarnation of a switching power supply back in the you know the late 70s early 80s when this was designed not only did they not manage to get rid of all the line the AC line harmonics but they also introduced a nice big spur near 20 kilohertz over there from their switching supply which is oh, you yeah. know get, that's almost a fingerprint for yeah. those generators sure. Any, anytime you see a plot with that little 20 hertz 20 kilohertz spur there you're, you're probably looking at something that came from uh, from one of these signal generators just not not really germane to the talk but it, it kind of tells you the level of detail you can infer from these plots they are very much a fingerprint of of this oscillator or the transmitter that's uh, that originated them. So uh, being able to measure phase noise at this at this level and lower is is super useful. Um, like I kind of suggested earlier, no source or device that's not running at absolute zero can avoid introducing you know some some degree of thermal noise. 
Uh, maybe it's all the way down at 177. Maybe it's maybe it's not, but it's going to be somewhere above there. Um, the uh, typical thing that you do when you're generating a microwave signal, which again was kind of germane to the original audience for this talk, is you'll generate a signal at a lower frequency and multiply it. Um, when you multiply a frequency, this uh, these phase noise graphs will go up by you know 20 20 times 20 dB for every time you go 10 times higher in the uh, in the frequency, and that's uh, that's a consequence of the fact that we're really just talking about time jitter. The uh, as the carrier period gets smaller, the jitter stays the same, uh, and the net result is that uh, as you multiply the uh, the signal, the jitter, the, the phase noise relative you know in dBc per hertz terms anyway gets worse. Uh, and that's uh, that's kind of a limiting factor, and another good reason why you want to uh, you want to be able to measure this type of thing is because there there are good ways to multiply a signal in in frequency, and there are bad ways. To, uh, the bad ways are actually a lot worse than twenty log n. Um, so if you if you're really looking to optimize a system, you've got to you've got to measure it both before and after multiplication, just to make sure you're not uh, degrading it by the uh, by the noise of the whatever mul multiplication or division mechanism you're using. And, you know, the, the bottom line on this slide is, is super germane. More money doesn't necessarily get you, get you better results. It's, uh, it's not black magic. I hate that term when it comes to RF stuff. It's all, it all comes down to physical laws, but you'll never really get in touch personally with those laws unless you uh, spend some time with equipment that can measure it. Uh, and understand what you're what you're dealing with in terms of actual hardware. It's, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff doesn't doesn't necessarily make sense when you when you first hear about it in a talk like this or or in a college classroom or reading it in a book or whatever. Um, get, getting getting your hands dirty is super important if you can. So how do we measure it? Um, three different. Um, main points on this slide are going to kind of occupy the rest of the rest of the talk. Uh, the first thing that that uh, comes to mind is, well, you just hook up a spectrum analyzer. Um, how many how many in here have used a spectrum analyzer? You have pretty much every you know, most people have at one point or another. Um, it's going to show you a big spike where your signal is. And most people don't pay too much attention to what happens on either side of that spike. Um, but the, but what happens on either side of that spike is that's your phase noise, your amplitude noise sidebands. Um, so measuring you, measuring phase noise is something you can do by looking at the actual behavior of that noise pedestal that appears on a spectrum analyzer display. So that's kind of the first thing that you, you tend to resort to. Um, there are two other methods that we'll talk about more later when we encounter the limitations of the first measurement or the first method. But uh, that's that's kind of the three the three uh, central ways to do this. Spec two forms of conventional spectrum analysis, and and one being direct digital uh, analysis at baseband. So direct direct spectrum analysis um, has some uh, has some attributes that uh, limit its use in some cases. It's good for some things, not so good for others. Uh, the first limitation is that it, you know a spectrum analyzer is not a vector instrument it can't distinguish between am noise and phase noise the the distinction can be important um, traditionally most sources are considered to have lower am noise than phase noise that's what you'll see if you look in any number of textbooks and papers it's not always true uh, in some cases am noise is worse the thing about AM noise is it goes away as soon as you run it into any kind of digital system or, or a saturated mixer or uh, any, any number of things that you're likely to do with your signal. Um, AM noise just will not be a big problem for it um, just because it, it doesn't affect the timing. It affects, you know, the actual amplitude, which, which is often of secondary importance. But you do have to keep that in mind because the spectrum analyzer is going to kind of show you the RMS sum of both. Um, the uh, the big limitation with the spectrum analyzer for measuring phase noise is that you're kind of pitting its local oscillator against whatever it is you're trying to measure. If you're building a microwave synthesizer, 
um, if yours is cleaner than the, the microwave synthesizer that came off the drawing board at you know, Hewlett Packard or Tectonics or Rota and Schwartz or some, some outfit like that, then um, that spectrum analyzer is not going to be able to measure your oscillator. Likewise, if your oscillator um, doesn't have the, the constraints that they had, you know, the, the, the guys doing the spectrum analyzer design have to build a sweeping local oscillator that can cover, you know, anything up to tens of gigahertz of spectrum space, uh, sweep across it really quickly, um, tune it very low, very low tuning, uh, tuning steps, very small tuning steps. They have a lot of constraints that you don't. Maybe you're just building a one gigahertz local oscillator or a 2.4 gigahertz local oscillator or something like that. Your oscillator only has to run at one frequency. It doesn't have to sweep at all. Chances are you're going to beat the pants off of those guys at HP. Uh, not because you're such a great synthesizer designer, but because you, your job is a whole lot easier than theirs was. And under those conditions, their spectrum analyzer is not going to be any good at telling you what your, your level of phase noise is. Um, so that's kind of the central problem, the, the central two problems, the second being a bigger deal than the first with direct spectrum analysis for noise measurement. Um, we can also kind of get into the, the nitty gritty details of how to calibrate the measurement for the, for the um, spectrum analyzer measurements, not, not really relevant here. Just suffice it to say that it's, it's the kind of thing that's best done in software as opposed to being done you know, by hand or by looking at a marker on the, on the screen. Not a huge deal. Any, any noise measurement system you're talking about is going to need software support. So enough said about that. This slide kind of amplifies what I was talking about earlier in terms of the, uh, the denied part of your, your phase noise spectrum. Um, there's a large, the area in blue is, is typically the area that you can't measure with a spectrum analyzer, again, because their local oscillator is dominating the, uh, the measurement. And again, it's, it's, it's largely unavoidable. Uh, if you're buying a spectrum analyzer for use in a communications monitor application or troubleshooting or any number of, any number of applications, you probably don't want to pay for an oscillator <coughs> you know, that pushes down that floor even farther. So manufacturers understand that and they generally don't try. So this is about as good as you can do. If you kind of compare that graph to what we saw earlier, uh, it's, I can't do that switching the slides back and forth very easily, but you'd find that neither of these two plots um, can really be visualized uh, on, a, on a traditional spectrum analyzer. Maybe the blue plot, which is another type of uh, signal generator, you might be able to see some of the close-in noise on a spectrum analyzer, but the, uh, the 8663 in the, in the purple plot, probably not. So here's uh, here's kind of the result of using uh, using software to uh, to talk to, to drive a spectrum analyzer and, and get noise plots out of it. Um, this is done by basically sweeping each decade, each log decade individually, <clears throat> and uh, putting each you know stitching them together in software to get a, a nice continuous plot. I know that's probably not visible to to most of you guys, but uh, the blue, the blue plot is what you get if you measure a good 100 megahertz crystal oscillator with a particular type of, you know, tectonic spectrum analyzer, a portable model. The others are uh, three different HP benchtop analyzers, or um, two, two of the others are, are huge HP benchtop analyzers. The red trace is from a really, you know, a relatively expensive and much newer HP portable. Um, again, none of these, if we could put those, uh, those signal generator plots on the same graph, these noise floors would be much higher than, uh, than what, you, what you'd need to take a look at those. So again, if you're measuring, you know, basic, you know, basic homebrew PLL, this is probably going to be okay. If you're doing it professionally or if you're serious about it, probably not. There's a couple of slides here where I, uh, I talked about indirect measurements of phase noise analysis. The, uh, the big problem with using a spectrum analyzer for phase noise measurement is the carrier. If you could get rid of the carrier, then you could obviously amplify the noise arbitrarily and measure it you know, at whatever level you want on the spectrum analyzer. That, that's really, really hard to do in the general case because you might be talking about a filter that's, you know, 10 hertz wide at, at uh, you know, 
gigahertz, a gigahertz or more. Um, indirect phase noise analysis off, you know, tends to work by down converting, heterodyning the signal uh, that you're measuring down to near DC where you can do that kind of filtering to get rid of your carrier uh, and then measure the result on the spectrum analyzer. There's a kind of an app note uh, from a crystal oscillator vendor on here that anybody who's interested in that could, uh, could take a look at. Um, I won't go too deeply into that except to say that uh, it has all of the calibration hassles and then some of the, uh, the conventional spectrum analyzer technique. Um, and it's even more demanding on the software side. So it's, it's, it's even less likely to be something you'd want to do by hand. Wouldn't yeah. the reference itself need to be extremely stable? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but if you're, I, ideally, the classical case for indirect analysis is you've got two of whatever you're testing. So what you're going to do is you're going to build two and you're going to heterodyne them together. The upper side band is at twice the frequency. You, it's easy to throw that away. The lower side band is DC. They're close, very close to DC. So it's easy to get rid of that, uh, that lower side band and just look at the noise. Uh, and, the, and then you subtract 3 dB under the, under the assumption that they're, they really are equal. Um, so the, the uh, hardware in an indirect analysis setup is generally geared towards phase locking these two sources together to keep uh, to maintain that that uh, same frequency relationship that, yeah. that lets you get rid of the carrier and lets you optimize the sensitivity of your you know the phase sensitivity of your uh, phase detector but it's kind of inside baseball that that uh, doesn't really apply to, to what we're doing you do get much better results out of this you get more or less arbitrarily good results down to near the thermal floor uh, um, if you can if you can pull this off if you can actually heterodyne your your source down to dc and get rid of the carrier uh, so this this plot if you took those earlier earlier graphs and plotted them on this graticule then you would see that yes indeed you can see you know you can get all the information about the uh the signal generators that were being measured in, in a setup like this that is super hard to see on here i know but that's uh these are some uh some higher quality sources being measured in the uh, with an indirect setup. Um, the um, these are unlike HF or 100 megahertz sources. These are actually microwave sources. So even though their absolute numbers on the phase noise scale at the left aren't so great, 110 dBc per hertz, 190, 80. These are up in these are up at X band uh, for the most part. So these are actually really decent performance levels. That would be again hard to hard to reach with any affordable spectrum analyzer by itself. And John, you uh, did you generate this data yourself? Mm -hmm. you? Yeah, this this um, this comes from a freeware application that I link to later that I that I did a while back. The phase, uh, the uh, detector hardware, and everything you built up. Yourself. This, uh, these particular graphs came from uh, a box that we'll see here oh, okay. later on. Okay. This, uh, this box here off to the left yeah. is, uh, is the test set that was used to generate these particular plots. Thank you. Um, did I go too far? There we go. Uh, there's a, uh, there's another method that doesn't require two sources. Uh, for indirect measurement, if you if you mix if you mix your signal under test with a delayed version of the same signal, um, you will you will be able to get some information about the phase noise side bands and get rid of the <coughs> test carrier at the same time. Um, so you can you, you can do baseband measurements with a delay line and get similar results for various for various mathematical reasons. This method this method kind of sucks. It's um, unless you have like an infinitely long delay line, you're going to have a really hard time measuring close to the carrier, um, as this this plot kind of shows. Mm. Uh, these numbers are are not going to be legible from from back there. But, uh, <laughs> with a one microsecond delay line, that's the 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 limit defined by that dark black line on the left that kind of curves around there. Um, with a one microsecond delay line, which is pretty darn long already, um, you're limited to like 60 dBc per hertz at, uh, at, at 10 hertz offset, which, which isn't much better than what you'd get from the spectrum analyzer, if at all. 
It's good if you, if you're um, if you need to make measurements far from the carrier, out past 100 kilohertz, it's a good way to go. A lot of commercial instruments were built using this technique. Um, I don't consider it super interesting, and I've never actually used it for anything, but it's it's of historical interest. This slide talks um, talks about you know a couple of things that can uh, can be done with a with a a residual test set like that where two ports are being fed with the same signal um, occasionally you know whereas this is a this is not a super useful method for measuring phase noise uh, of an oscillator the the notion of a of putting a delay line um, in a signal path and, and, and reading a delayed, measuring a delayed version of the signal against itself is useful if you want to know how much phase noise an amplifier adds for instance uh, if you want to see its additive noise characteristics. Uh, so that's one application for that. It's, uh, you know, it, it has a few constraints of its own, but by and large, you know, as long as you can, as long as you can maintain a 90 degree phase shift at the, at the mixer that's doing your DC conversion, um, you can get a good, you can get a good feel for the baseband or, or the, uh, the additive noise once it's been down converted to baseband. Uh, so these are some examples of that. Um, this, these plots were taken uh, with the uh, the big rack on the right hand side of this of uh, of this page. That's called an HP 3048A system, which was for you know 20 or 20 years or more kind of the standard way to do all kinds of phase noise measurements. How much did that cost? Um, back in the day, you'd probably be looking at around uh, 200k worth of hardware in this in this photo. Uh, alone. It, How much did your time pod cost? A five thousand. So it's you know courses for courses. They're, they're they each have their strengths. The um, the time pod made it a whole lot easier to do a lot of these things. But the thirty forty eight A is you know I still have one of those one of those racks and 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 I always will because there's some I mean it, it's it it does some tricks that that uh, not everything else can do as easily. Anyway, these are, uh, you've seen these types of plots before on the earlier slides. Um, I'm measuring the additive noise of different amplifiers here. Uh, these are small little uh, monolithic microwave integrated circuit amplifiers from many circuits. You'll see them in a lot of, uh, a lot of equipment if you've seen, you know, probably your like repeaters and things use these in their front ends. It's a good way to get low noise gain at 50 ohms. Uh, cheap. These things are only you know, only a few bucks a piece. Uh, they're great for home brewing. A lot of people use them. This is what they do to the phase noise of the signal that goes that goes through them. It's it's similar to what you'd see from a noise figure meter. Um, similar but different. Different types of noise are being looked at, but but they have a lot of the same influences. So this this type of equipment is good for both both oscillator noise and amplifier noise measurements. So. This is kind of when I went off down the rabbit hole of, of um, can I build one of these? What's involved? Um, what kind of performance can I expect? It's fairly easy to homebrew your own quadrature PLL, which is the again the topology embodied by the phase by the 3048A. That's a complicated looking rack of gear, but it really just comes down to a mixer. That's um, you know seeing. You know, two two signals at the same frequency being mixed mixed down to baseband for analysis. At the time I started work, working on this stuff, um, it was becoming easy to get really high performance sound cards uh, for like 192 kilohertz audio and things like that, which is which it seems like a natural fit for baseband analysis. So I started looking into that. Um, the um, Again, I don't want to get get too far into the details, but uh, I wrote some software to support measurements on various devices. Um, it's still, it was, and is still downloadable for anybody who ever has a sim feels a similar uh, need to scratch that particular itch. Um, both both the quadrature PLL and the earlier uh, these residual measurements. I mentioned that they end up being performed at baseband, and that's kind of what this slide talks about. Um, using an FFT analyzer, an audio analyzer, a sound card, any number of different ways to do baseband analysis um, is uh, is an obvious shortcut for measuring phase noise at baseband. 
And so that was one of the first things that I looked into. Um, it had all the, uh, at, at the time I didn't own an HP 3048A rack or any of this other gear, so I'm just kind of looking for ways to, to, to take the easy way out and homebrew it. Um, so this was one of the first homebrew efforts I, I kind of engaged in. This was a 24-bit, uh, a one mega sample, or two and a half mega sample Sigma Delta converter. Um, it was uh, a super hot chip, you know, released by analog devices in like the 2008 time frame. So I, uh, I kind of climbed, climbed the learning curve on both phase noise measurement and FPGA work at the same time by duct taping these two boards together. One's an FPGA trainer and the other is the, uh, the demo board for the 24-bit Sigma Delta chip. And that's kind of what that ended up looking like. Uh, and here's yet another plot you can't really see from back there, but uh, I'm comparing the uh, I'm comparing an HP 3048A measurement on the right with uh, a similar measurement from my base, my homebrew baseband digitizer on the left, and um, I've got I'm still I'm still AC coupling for various reasons, so I fall off down near one hertz. But beyond uh, 10 hertz or so, from 10 hertz out to a megahertz, I have pretty good uh, fidelity compared to the you know the fancy the big fancy rack of uh, rack of gear. So that was kind of a promising, you know, th this wasn't a finished product by any means, but it was kind of a promising avenue to explore. And it kind of led me into the next, uh, the next level of the rabbit hole, um, which again, I had already fallen into over at Tom's place when I saw his, his 5120 analyzer. Um, it, it was fairly clear when I saw that particular box over at Tom's that I was really just looking at an SDR, a, a software defined radio. Uh, something that can do baseband, baseband noise measurement just by virtue of the fact that hey, it's a it's a baseband receiver. It down converts to baseband. It it does everything at baseband. Um, why don't I just go ahead and uh, and digitize the RF signal directly instead of converting it in a mixer with a uh, with a secondary signal source that has to be at the same frequency? Um, mm -hmm. The question that uh, that Sam Stein asked himself when he when his team designed the 5120 was. Let's just do direct digitization. The only source we need is the clock driving the ADC, and we can we can take that out by subtraction um, with multiple converters. So I kind of uh, I kind of couldn't resist going down that path. Um, and this is uh, this is kind of some of the justification financially. The first question I asked Tom when I saw this box, it doesn't look like anything that fancy. What does this cost? And he goes like, Oh, this was like twenty five thousand dollars. Like, oh, okay, I I see. Um, I didn't have twenty-five thousand dollars to to spend on it, so that that again was an added incentive to kind of look into how this works to uh, to build one. The uh, the other big dog in this business was the Agilent fifty fifty two A and B analyzers, um, which are closer to a hundred thousand dollars. Those are those use some some somewhat similar principles to the fifty one twenty, but not exactly the same thing. Um, it's more of a digital. It's more of a, 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 a digital era redesign of the older 3048A rack, and the price tag is pretty similar. You know, six figures without without really you know getting too crazy with the uh, the option list. So it made sense to uh, kind of I'll skip ahead here. Kind of go back to the the business of uh, gluing demo boards together from different ADC manufacturers and putting them together with the uh, the. Uh, if the Nexus 2 FPGA board that I was using previously. Uh, so now the, the big difference between this and the previous baseband analyzer that I built, there's only one ADC board here and there's two of them here and that corresponds to the, uh, the basic block diagram of one of these direct digital analyzer instruments. Um, so there's, uh, by using two ADCs, um, we can take advantage of the fact that the clock noise is common to both of them, and uh, get rid of the, get get rid of the clock noise. Um, or, and there's there's a couple of things you can do. You can either you can either get rid of the clock noise by cross correlation, or you can get rid of or the need for a separate reference um, and measure both uh, you know drive drive both ADCs from the same signal ender test. And that was kind of the approach that I, uh, I tried at first with this. Um, this is great for timing performance, a phase comparator that's good for phase noise measurement, coming back full circle to long-term stability measurement. Um, they're both excellent 
or, or they're both excellent applications for, for uh, direct digital phase measurement. And this was uh, this was one of the first plots that I took that kind of uh, kind of made me made me think I was going to succeed in in uh, building my own uh, my own test set. The, uh, let's see the uh, the fifty one twenty. Um, do I have a residual plot for that? Yeah, the the gray, the very lowest plot on this graph, again, lower numbers being better, um, is the res, is the instrument floor from one of those 5120s, TOMS in particular. At one second, again, what the Allen deviation graph tells you is that, is that in this case, at one second, it's better than one part in 10 to the 14, you know, 10 parts per quadrillion. Uh, at you know from one second to the next at measuring frequency, uh, which is yeah now we're now we're talking we're we're already you know ten or a hundred times better than the best counters, uh, if we can come close to the performance of that 5120, and that actually is what happened with that that homebrew kludge in the earlier the earlier slide, um, you can see that in the uh, the green dashed line here. It's a little bit worse than the uh, than, than the 5120, but it cost you know like 200 bucks instead of 25 grand, so that was uh, that was a pretty promising result. I've um, I've also kind of compared it with some other instrumentation for uh, you know for noise me or for for long term stability measurement, but the real money shot on here is the is the is the gray line and the green line right above it. Um, those were uh, those were some of the results that made me think I should I should kind of get farther into this. Um, when I added phase noise support to the software, um, that was really awesome because now, you know, the uh, I can measure a really high performance oscillator in the minus 170 dB hertz range that I you know previously again took that you know 100,000 to 200,000 dollar rack or the 25,000 dollar box. To measure, and these results came from that same $200, um, you know, homebrew homebrew kludge. So I was pretty happy with that. One thing led to another, and I eventually did, like Dennis said, commercialize that. Um, the uh, the first the first incarnation was called the Time Pod. That's the box up there on, at upper left. It had all of these units have four ADCs instead of just two uh, to make them. To, to get rid of the uh, the compromise between having to measure um, having to get rid of the clock noise from the measurement versus being able to measure one source of, or uh, measure down well below the clock noise floor, you know, like get rid of that. I don't, I've never seen that. So uh, that must be PowerPoint. Um, so they all have four channels. The newest. Um, the newest box is the one that I actually have here making the measurement on the cesium standard right now, uh, which you're welcome to come up and take a look at. It's um, not only does it have four ADCs in the box, but it actually exposes all four connections to the outside world. So you can do all kinds of all kinds of interesting measurements that that I couldn't do with either of the two boxes and that you couldn't do with the, uh, the earlier uh, TSC 5120. Looks like the cesium lock. Well, it's still got the alarm light on there. Um, it's more stable. Yeah, it does not. Um, I'll, have, I'll have to borrow that that nail file again. I think the uh, I think the integrator is is railed. And it's probably not going to recover from that unless I unless I cycle the power on it. Or unless I open the loop and close it again. Let's see. Anyway, this is there we go. Let's see if it stays. So the green light is good. The green light means that yes, we are locked to the cesium beam resonance. Hopefully it'll stay put. Magic nail. Yeah. John, what is the frequency bandwidth of these ADCs and these devices that you've built? The ADCs that I've been using are HF parts, HF to lower VHF. Um, they are clocked at around 100 megahertz, 50 to 100 megahertz, and they're you know rated for use either in the first Nyquist zone, half that, or uh, you know potentially up to you know four or five hundred megahertz if you <clears throat> if you use them as, as subsampling devices. Which the the phase station does, but the time pod did not. Um, they are usable with down converters, just like any other 
test, test equipment if you need to go beyond that. And that is actually the last um, the last slide here. These are the this is the credit page from the original presentation. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the references on my my page where I kind of bibliographically collect all this info is are from HP and Agilent app notes. Um, Agilent and Keysight have been great about about helping everybody get these documents together and, and organized and not you know, not attempting to sue them off the internet, which is always good. Um, the uh, the fellow who contributed a lot of the graphs from the uh, from the indirect noise measurement pages, uh, Mark Mislong, I think his name is. He unfortunately passed away a couple of years after the first draft of this presentation. Um, but uh, certainly, any anybody who's um, he, which is a shame. He had a really great site where he collected a lot of info and brochures and that notes which is now just taken over by spammers and you know, just total, total uh, junk. Um, but the page at the link on top, if, if anybody wants to like take a look at any of this stuff, go to that link. That's really the only one, uh, <clears throat> the only one that you need to kind of see where a lot of these, a lot of this stuff comes from and uh, a lot of what, what inspired me to get into it. Um, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it. 